I'm Matthew C. Levin, President and CEO of the Jewish Federation of South Palm Beach County. And I am Sandy Altner, and I'm very happy to have you with us today. I am a volunteer with the um, Boca Raton Historical Society and Museum, and we are embarking on this project to collect oral histories of uh, the Jewish community of Boca Raton, and we're very pleased that you're able to join us today, May 15th. 2017. We are at Lynn University in the lovely library and um, are very happy to have you join us to tell us about your experiences in the Jewish community here. Well, thank you for letting me be part of this project. I've heard enough about it from some of your board members uh, and it's a very worthwhile project too to have a testimony of this community and how this community has evolved. Well, thank you very much. And um, so let's start with the fact that you are the first person that I've, I've interviewed in this project who was not actually someone who's moved to Florida. Tell me a little bit about your background and how your family sure. came to reside in Florida. So my story is it's probably not that different from a lot of stories. Uh, my mom was from Chicago. Uh, uh, she moved down when she was 15. Parents were poor. Uh, my grandfather was a um, rail railroad pullman. Um, and a bare knuckle, bare knuckle brawler, and um, and he came down. Uh, it, it, my, they were older. My mom was an only child, and my uh, grandfather was 50, and my grandmother was 43 when my mother was born. So um, they thought that she was sick, and they realized that she actually had a had a baby in her tummy. Uh, my dad's parents were from Baltimore, and my grandfather was a baker, and he was working at. Um, one of the uh, resorts in the Catskills uh, with other folks who said, well, really, um, the, you know, the, the, the streets are paved with gold in Miami Beach. Um, so stop working up in upstate New York. And my grandfather uh, came down a season before and started working as a baker in one of the big um, beach hotels in Miami Beach and brought my mom, I mean, brought my grandmother and my dad and his sister down. Uh, and so they moved down when my dad was 16, and uh, mom and dad, uh, you know, was here. Dad was uh, went to Korea. It was not in, didn't serve in Korea. Was uh, stateside. Was in the but was in the army during Korea. Korea, and then he started University of Miami. And while he was older than my mom, he started college at the same time as my mom because of the GI Bill. And he because after he got out, he he went to went to the army, and they made a home in Miami. Um, but your family originally, your grandparents, then came down in what year, and where did they settle? So they came down. Uh, they came down in uh, my let's see, probably the mid '40s. Uh, so you probably you're probably towards the end of the war, uh, uh, and they settled. Uh, my grandparents came down, and uh, my dad's parents came down in '46, and my mom's parents came down, I think, in '47 or '48, in time for her to go to University of Miami, and then Dad came down afterwards. And was they, there much of a Jewish community in the 1940s in South Florida? Small. Uh, on Miami Beach, it was a small community. There were still parts of Miami Beach that were um, that were close to the Jewish community. Surprisingly, on Miami Beach, uh, but there was already be a beginning of the Jewish community by the late '40s and the '50s. Miami Beach had started to evolve into a tourist desp destination with, you know, some of the great uh, lounge acts of the time coming in and playing down on Miami Beach uh, and North Beach. Um, they both ended up at University of Miami in the '50s. Um, and got married in '56, uh, and uh, I have two older brothers, um, both born at Jackson Memorial from Miami. What was interesting about my family and my Jewish uh, journey was that both sets of grandparents were also came from this country. Uh, it was my great grandparents who came from the old country. So uh, my great grandparents came. You're talking about somewhere around 1870, 1875, um, when they arrived. Uh, so we have relatively deep roots, and while certainly we had cousins and others who were affected by the Holocaust, all of our immediate family had already left Europe by the time the Nazi regime had come to power, um, both out of Poland and out of uh, Romania, and, uh, and then a small uh, piece out of uh, what was white Russia at the time. Um, so uh, the Holocaust for us was um, a big subject in our house, because my parents, who weren't as affected uh, an immediate one-off in the family. Um, my dad was uh, heavily engaged in the post-Holocaust movement to establish the State of Israel. And in Baltimore, he was part of um, Habonim, which was a Zionist youth organization. And uh, to the day Pop died, would tell the stories about being in Baltimore and he and his friends collecting guns for the War of Independence from farmers and uh, people out in the sticks, 
Baltimore, even Baltimore, Maryland was still relatively uh, rural, you know, in 19, uh, circa 1940s. And then they would bring these guns up to um, Long Island. They'd put them on boats and take them, uh, take them out. And this was right around the time his dad was moving to Florida in 46, 47, 48. Um, and so, you know, this subject of Israel and the Holocaust became part of the motivating uh, uh, points in the life for both me and my brothers. So we grew up in a house where Israel, Judaism, the Holocaust, um, Jewish identity was the, uh, was the trick of the trade and the conversation in the house. We were a conservative household. Um, not was it a very religiously observant ho household? Not one way or the other. We celebrated. You know, we lit candles on Shabbat and we celebrated the high holidays and we and we went to synagogue. You know, um, semi regularly. My parents were both involved in uh, the synagogue. My dad is an officer of the synagogue. My mom was heavily involved uh, in Women's League for Conservative Judaism. She was a past president of the state of Florida. So we were involved in USY. Both my uh, both of my brothers and myself were very involved in BBYO which really was the shaping point for me. I mean, uh, BBYO, B'nai B'rith Youth Organization, at the time, at those days, especially in the 70s and 80s, was a real heyday uh, in America. USYs had actually diminished very much. Uh, and BBYO was the preeminent kind of organization, at least in South Florida, for Jewish kids to get involved in. So I had become actively involved. And that experience for those four years of high school and, and going off to college became kind of my, you know, my data point. I knew that, you know, Israel and Judaism were very, very important to me, not just religiously, but culturally and spiritually and institutionally, and that you know this was something I, I wanted to do. And Israel at the time, when I went off to college in 1982, um, was really under attack on a worldwide ways basis. You had just come off the Lebanon War. Um, Israel was, uh, was being accused of war crimes related to the Christian camps in Lebanon. Um, and the media, which had for the first, um, you know, 40 years of Israel's existence uh, treated Israel more of a darling, you know, as the David to Goliath in the onslaught of the Arab countries, that started to switch. Mm -hmm. Israel was becoming now a major military force in the region, the economy. And so by the time I graduated college, I knew that I wanted to go to Washington and, um, and change the world. So you, first of all, though, grew up in, um, in Hollywood, Florida. Hollywood, Florida. Okay, and went to school. Went to, went to high school in Hollywood, Florida, went to college at University of South Florida in Tampa. Um, until the day I graduated college, you know, my friends, my social life existed from the folks that I knew growing up in Hollywood in high school, uh, through either through high school or through BYO, and ultimately ended up in college together. Um, and I stayed in Florida. I didn't want to go away to college. Uh, I wasn't all that interested in going up north. You know, I was a, a bit of a mama's boy and uh, liked being close to my parents. And I was very close to my, uh, my at that point, uh, I, I was down to one grandmother. Uh, my, my last grandfather died. My dad's father died in 1980. So in 1982, I was still very close to my grandmother. In fact, my senior year of high school was the year that she gave up driving and turned her car over to me. Uh, and uh, and so, so Saturdays, I would pick up my grandmother and uh, either take her to shul or take her to the synagogue, um, take her to Publix, take her shopping, go to lunch. Uh, and that was a you know special moment, and my grandmother and I were always always tight. So I stayed close to home to college. I went to Tampa and come back you know uh, periodically. Well, you um, had uh, most of your career though has been involved in directly, and with that kind of background, it's clear to see mm -hmm. that there was a natural path for you to become professionally involved in Jewish. Um, causes, Jewish sure. community, and so on. How did that manifest itself? What did you do? It, it started in college. I, um, I, because of the kind of uh, kitchen table we had at home, where foreign policy events of the day were the watchword and the discussions at our, at our house, um, I was much more attuned to you know the front page of the New York Times uh, or what was happening internationally. This is long before CNN, long before the internet, long before. And so I got to college and I kind of was drawn to political activism. Uh, so the great political issues of the day in 1982 was what was happening in Latin America, the fight in Nicaragua and El Salvador's. Uh, I had a professor that was um, uh, heavily engaged in some of this dialogue and was actually a consultant to the State Department. And so I got engaged in kind of this you know, political discourse and started working on political campaigns. And I realized that any campa campaign, I mean, I, I was working for Democrats in those days, um, because, and especially at that point, uh, the Jewish community was heavily Democratic in the, you know, the late 70s, 1980s. Um, there wasn't a lot of really active Republican Jews. That, that started to come of, come of age a little later in the 80s as you got closer to the Reagan 
um, as you got closer to you know the end of Reagan and beginning of Bush. But but even in even with the early days of the Reagan administration, there were still few and far between. So I was working for Democratic candidates, but most importantly, the Democratic candidate had to be good on Israel. They had to be supportive of the bipartisan relationship between the United States and Israel, supporting foreign aid, supporting defense aid against defense. Um, sales, uh, military sales to Saudi Arabia and the Arab countries. Uh, we never wanted to make, we wanted to make sure that Israel kept its strategic qualitative edge uh, over its, its neighbors. Okay. Uh, and that drove that particular piece. For, for me, you know, as I went through college uh, and ultimately worked on campaigns, uh, I said when I went to Washington, this was ultimately the, the path I wanted to follow. And I know you spent a lot of time at APAC. Sure. I spent 25 years at APAC. You know. And were you in Florida at that time? No, I started in Washington. I started in 1987 working in Washington. My first job at APAC was... Um, Could uh, you explain what APAC yes. is yes. So APAC is the American-Israel Public Affairs Committee, founded in uh, 1954 um, as a, uh, largely as a Washington-based advocacy organization um, uh, to lobby Congress on behalf of the U.S. and uh, Israel relationship, the economic and military relationship between the two countries, based on a series of shared values and freedoms of press and religion and expression and um, and ultimately the organization um, went along with as a relatively successful advocacy organization until 1981. In 1981 the Reagan administration which to this day remains one of the most pro administrations we ever had it didn't start out that way. They, they started out with um, a, a big war chest uh, proposing arms sales to the Arab countries as a way of sp splitting those Arab countries away from the, the Soviet Union at the time part of its Cold War strategy. Uh, so in 1981, they proposed the sale of AWACS to Saudi Arabia. And the national Jewish community, not only APAC, but synagogues, UJA, federations, created a nationwide lobbying campaign against the AWAC sale. Uh, and we lost. We lost by two votes. Um, and that was a seminal moment for the pro-Israel advocacy movement because we realized that we couldn't be simply a Washington-based organization anymore. We had to start building grassroots support, congressional district by congressional district. And did and you come to Florida at that time? No, I was, uh, so I was, this was 1981, I was still in college, uh, I got back, I got to Washington in 1987, by the time I got to 1987, we were a $12 million organization, had one regional office, and began opening regional offices around the country. Uh, and when I left in uh, uh, 2012, they were an $80 million organization with nine regional offices around the country. In that 25-year period, you had a series of seminal events that helped um, fashion the APAC of today, uh, uh, the Oslo process. I'm sorry. Okay, that's all right. Please. I just wanted to get, because I don't want to run out of time, I that's want to okay. talk with you about um, the, uh, the changes in the Boca Raton community. Sure. And so were you working at APAC in uh, South Florida as well? Yes, I started working. Uh, so I moved down uh, and started working for APAC in... Um, in 1991 uh, here and was almost immediately thrown into um, the South Palm Beach County community as one of my first jobs. All right. Now, what did you see in 1991 in South Florida so in the way of the Jewish community? Absolutely. So, so philanthropy and um, both advocacy in terms of both APAC and the pro israel movement, but also in terms of philanthropy with organizations, uh, Boca in 1991 was very much a snowbird-driven community. Um, one of the giants of our community is a, a man who passed away uh, a year and a half ago uh, by the name of Abby Levine, Abner Levine. Abby was a great, great, great champion for not just Federation, but APAC. He was the APAC chair at the time, uh, but he was heavily involved in Federation too. And literally, when I took the job down here, uh, my boss at the time, Richard Fishman, who's now the vice CEO of APAC in, in Washington, said, you need to go see Abby Levine. And Abby Levine uh, was one of these guys who literally would get on the phone and set up four or five or six appointments for you and open the doors. He was uh, kind of the king of Del Air with when it came to Jewish life and Jewish philanthropy and Jewish activism. Uh, and until his death just two years ago was a giant of um, all kind of Jewish philanthropy. He was heavily engaged in Federation. Uh, the boardroom at our, uh, at our, on our campus is a Levine boardroom. Uh, and Abby really shaped my way of, uh, of looking at this community. 1991, you had a community that was still uh, driven by snowbirds parachuting coming down um, tax reasons, for our residential reasons, retiring reasons. You had a small indigenous community here that was involved in, 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 in Jewish life, but largely involved in day schools. They weren't heavily involved in organ national organizations like APAC or ADL. Uh, 
uh, and they really weren't that engaged in um, federation, somewhat, in things like young leadership or national young leadership, men's and women's cabinet. Um, but it really was a snowbird kind of driven thing. And what was strange about this community is that no one's from here. Uh, and so people were moving down from those communities in Boston and New York and Pittsburgh and, and Chicago, and they'd already had almost a lifetime of philanthropic and volunteer experiences up north while they were building their business. So they were already used to being in charge. And so they came to a community that didn't have a lot of experience. We had just broken off from the Palm Beach Federation. We were a relatively small federation at the time. Um, and it took, uh, you know, and so the campaign grew um, as the community grew and as the Snowbird community grew. But there wasn't a sense of um, always, there was never a great sense of community. Uh, in South Palm Beach County, and I think that echoed for, 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 for 20 years what, after that. What brought people to Florida? Why did this become such a, a large Jewish community? Boca Raton is, um, according to recent numbers that we've seen, is, is more than 50% of the people who live in Boca Raton are Jewish, identify as Jewish, identify which means Jewish. very complex things, of course, of course. They, depending on who you ask. But uh, that makes us the most densely populated neighborhood in the world outside of Israel that's Jewish. We will know more in a year. We're actually starting a demographic study uh, this summer, uh, which will give us some new numbers. But we expect those numbers to reinforce uh, your, your notion. Look, I think it was a lot of things. I think it was the tax issue, that there's no uh, state income tax. I think you were able to grow land and build communities. Um, other than Miami, Fort Lauderdale, Boca. What do you mean grow land? Meaning you had land here, you could grow developments and grow homes and grow, you know, the gated community thing that people wanted to have. They wanted to have a place that they could call their own. Part of what they wanted to call their own is they wanted to live behind, you know, gates. That some people came here because they simply wanted to retire and play golf and play tennis. Um, and there are, and, and living behind gated communities allowed them to do that. We can get away from the the rush of all the philanthropies and pushing. But it also became the social structure. It became their life. It became their philanthropic structure and ultimately became part of how they did their Jewish philanthropy. Um, but what is it about Boca Raton that, do you, d that makes you think this was particularly attractive to a Jewish population? For Lauderdale and Palm Beach were um, in the 70s, 80s, and probably even the early 90s, in many ways cut off from the Jewish community. You had um, no Jews allowed in certain country clubs. And there were country clubs that until, literally I can tell you in the last, uh, the last five to 10 years, that still practiced you know, a no Jews allowed policy. Um, Boca was untapped. You know, Boca was still very much a small suburban Eastern community. You hadn't grown out West. You hadn't grown you know, the Western suburbs by 1991 and 1992. Um, as you started to see people come down, they said, you know what, let's move to Boca. Let's make this into this Jewish community. You had synagogues that were, uh, were undergoing incredible growth, like Rabbi Singer's synagogue, uh, Rabbi Agler's synagogue uh, it, it later on. B'nai Torah had become a, a large synagogue. And then ultimately, the Orthodox community started to grow as you got closer to 2000. Uh, and it became a community that, um, that I think people ultimately identified with as a place that could be not just simply a snowbird-driven community with the gated communities, but for those snowbirds who wanted to stay longer, six, seven, eight, nine months a year, they would come down and do that. Uh, because people, once you're, once you're six months in a day, there's no difference between six months in a day and eight months. Uh, and so we've seen the evolution between 1991 and today of a community that's now balanced both by the snowbird community. You still have a very large snowbird community, and as you point out, one of the largest. But the indigenous community has grown up. And the difference between 1991 and today, and I, I can certainly talk more about this, is um, that now there's a sense of community. You know, what's, what's happened is, like any community. Is this it, a sense of being a Jewish community, do you much think? Much more so than it's been. Mm -hmm. I mean, Pittsburgh, you know, as an example, and we were talking about Pittsburgh earlier, we were talking about uh, with uh, somebody else, or you're talking about Boston or Chicago, are 100-year-old communities, 75-year-old communities. Jews have been living there. Even Miami has, has three or four or five generations of Jews that have grown up in the community and that can now take a role in federation and ADL and APAC and Jewish life at, at, at large. Boca is only into the second generation of those people living here. So the people that have now raised their families, that have built their businesses here, their kids are graduating high school or college right now. You know, you're only in the last 15, 20 years. And that change has allowed a much greater
um, sense of community. So, so what did the what did the seventy five year old living in a condo along Boca Highlands have in common with the forty something that lived along four forty one? If they didn't, if if they sat on a border committee, that was the only time that they ever would interact. Today, what we've been able to do over the last five to ten years is begin building more um, fountains, more portals of entry, more places for people to come together, regardless of age, regardless of uh, wealth. And so today, if you look at the Board of Federation today in 2017 versus the Board in 1991, it's a mix of the indigenous community that's grown up here, uh, raised their kids here, building their businesses here, um, and, uh, and uh, the group of snowbirds that want to remain engaged in Jewish life, not just where they were, but also want to now come down here and use that experience to help us. Um, how important is it to have an engaged Jewish community in Boca Raton? It's, 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 it's priceless. Um, what's happened today is the Jewish community has really been really great about reaching out long past the Jewish borders. I Meaning if you look at the institutions in town, like Lynn University, FAU, um, Boca Regional Hospital, Festival of the Arts, the Jewish community has um, very much come outside of its shell and created partnerships with the, you know, the more secular agencies in town um, to be part of the greater community, meaning we're not simply just a Jewish community that stays within our own. And I think that's a good thing. I think that a, that a more um, sophisticated community, a more mature community um, is involved from a business perspective, philanthropic perspective, uh, beyond our own community. That really, if you look at Miami, uh, you look at a Miami Federation or a Miami Jewish community where you have giants in Miami like Norman Brayman and Michael Adler who get engaged in Jewish life but are also involved in the arts and secular and they're involved in cancer centers and they're involved in building, you know, uh, treatment centers uh, for, uh, for those with um, Alzheimer's. Uh, so uh, I think our community has become that kind of community, a much more sophisticated community that understands that uh, a Jewish community that's engaged in the larger community will only be successful because it will attract okay. the kind of uh, partnerships and dollars ultimately uh, that will let, uh, let us help those that, that can't help themselves. At what point do you think that B Boca Raton, Florida ended up being recognized by the nation as a Jewish city? Well, it's funny. Uh, um, the funny answer would be the hanging chads of 2000. Um, I, I think that in many ways the election of 2000 heralded new attention to South Florida and South Palm Beach County specifically. If you look at every election since 2000, just about every election, either a key House race, Senate race, or presidential race, we're the, we're the target of what's happening in the rest of the country, meaning we're the national news. Um, you know, so you saw it in Ron Klein's race against Clay Shaw, and you saw it in when Klein ultimately beat Shaw, and then you saw it in Allen, uh, um, the person who came after uh, Ron Klein, who beat Ron Klein, um, Alan West. And then you've seen it in President Obama's race, from John Kerry's race in 04. So, so part of it has been the attention that we've gotten politically um, because it's such an interesting political community, meaning a Jewish community that's heavily democratic, so it's big democratic voices, um, and yet you've had this rise in more Republican-involved Jews who have significant money. So you know, you're now you're seeing candidates of both sides, not just coming into Boca, taking it for granted that the Democrats are going to win. Uh, they're willing to fight tooth and nail for votes in, in a community like this. And I think this last election showed it. So I think Boca became a, um, a community, in all seriousness, in some time you know, late in the 90s, really after 2000, uh, because of the attention that we got. And we had to play catch up in many ways. Because you have to, be, you have to act like a sophisticated community then. You have to act like a community that's um, that's now a deciding community nationally. But do you think it is seen as a, a Jewish community across the country? I mean, I'm, you're talking about the political part of it and the, polit and the importance of the Jewish vote and, and within mm -hmm. that context, yes, I understand what you're, what you're saying, but I mean, overall, did you see Boca as a Jewish community? And if so, when did that evolve? Well, that I think it became part of the identity? greater South Florida Jewish community. So I think that when you talk about a Jewish community in America and you talk about the largest Jewish community outside of Israel or New York, you have to take all the tri-county area together. So, you know, some estimates are, let's call us 750,000 Jews when the snowbirds are not here, and let's call us a million or a million two when the snowbirds are in town. Um, South Palm Beach County being at 125 or 130 or whatever that number is going to be um, has given us important clout. 
as a, certainly as a top philanthropic community. I mean, there's no, uh, I'll give you an example just so you have a sense of it from the Jewish community. Um, all of the Northern Federations do an event in season in South Palm Beach County. So, because they're coming to see their donors that are down here also. Every national organization, there are few communities in the country where every national American Friends of organization will do a reception in season. So Palm Beach and Boca are unique to almost any community in the country because of the competition for the philanthropic dollar during the seasonal nature of our community. That's allowed the community to become, one of the ways it's allowed to become a much more sophisticated and much more known community uh, over the last two decades because we are such a large philanthropic community. So Technion and Weitzman and uh, Hebrew University and Tel Aviv University and the Israel Tennis Center and Israel Cancer Research um, and ADL and APAC and Israel Bonds and JNF, Friends of the IDF. I mean, it's literally, um, for many of our snowbirds who are involved in Jewish philanthropy, um, in some cases their social life is wrapped up in the philanthropy. That, that's, a, um, that's a change over the last 20 years where that's become the driver of the way we drive this community, uh, where there's so many both fil you know, great charities to, to choose from, uh, but also the way in which they've made Boca their, um, you know, the heart of their fundraising piece. You know. How has the Jewish community shaped Greater Boca? You know, I think without the influence of a thriving Jewish community, and I think over the last, um, you know, 20 some odd years that we've had our campus out west, it's helped. Um, we have a 100 acre campus as a Jewish Federation and all of our agencies are on the campus. Um, but I think that we've added to the cultural riches of this community. I think How that so? when you, I think that you, um, uh, Holocaust survivors, um, we have the largest you know, population of Holocaust survivors uh, in the country uh, living in Palm Beach County, uh, living in the Tri-County area, definitely. Um, so uh, FAU has created a wonderful program on Holocaust studies and Holocaust research and are doing testimony uh, with these Holocaust survivors. You couldn't have that kind of interaction if you didn't have the volume and you didn't have a caring Jewish community and we have rabbis like Rabbi Levin and Rabbi Stein and others who continue to remind us and teach us. Um, the federation that runs a March of the Living that keeps the Holocaust as part of a central narrative of the Jewish community because um, it's very easy in our community these days. Our community doesn't always want to hear, the younger community doesn't always want to hear about the Holocaust in the same way and yet uh, uh, the Jewish community, we, we, we spend, uh, we say never again because it has real meaning. Uh, and so uh, the ways in which our partnership with things like FAU have, have come up or with uh, the Lynn University has made us much more relevant. Also the way in which the Jewish community has engaged in the economy here. Big business owners, um, corporations, you know, that have all been in, in here and out of here. Office Depot, Tyco, uh, IBM when it was still here. Um, uh, you know, the development that's gone on here. A lot of it are Jewish businessmen who have, uh, you know, who have grown their families here and are building their business here and now, you know, um, uh, giving back to the community, engaged in, in creating a life here for both the Jewish and non-Jewish community. It's one of those communities where I think um, uh, there's been a really enormously positive overlap between the Jewish business community and the greater community. So you think about the financial services community, the legal community, the development community. Um, politically, I think uh, this is a, a community that, uh, that has not just, I mean, national politics, but even local politics, a community that says, you know, um, we want to do everything we can to make ourselves uh, uh, the kind of community we can be proud of. And we're, it's not always hard. I mean, it's not always easy to do because we don't have a downtown per se. We're stuck between the downtowns of Miami and Fort Lauderdale and Palm Beach. So, Boston, so, so South Palm Beach County and Boca specifically, Delray to a, sec to a second extent, um, has to go the extra mile to draw people in to a non-business community, you know, because people can bypass us. So either come here, to, you come here to live, you come here to socialize, or you come here, um, uh, you know, for philanthropy or other reasons. Um, but, uh, you know, we don't have a downtown to speak of. When you look at um, how it is that the Jewish community has shaped Boca Raton, what are the th three things that really stand out to you that uh, without a Jewish community here, we wouldn't look like this. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about perhaps in the medical area and perhaps in some of the other areas. Can you give me an idea from yeah. your perspective? What? Yeah, well, I would, st I would start with healthcare. I mean, I look healthcare, I think that the, the growth at Boca Regional Hospital, so some of the greatest philanthropists in our community, people like uh, uh, Billy and uh, Bernie Marcus and uh, Harvey and Phyllis Sandler, 
uh, and so many others who have given enormous amount of money, tens of millions of dollars, to making us have a world-class healthcare center in our backyard. That wouldn't happen otherwise. I think FAU, you know, I think FAU has uh, uh, has done incredibly well, uh, especially in the last few years under President Kelly. Um, but I think FAU's real success has been has been part of it has been uh, its relationship with the Jewish community. So they one of the first universities uh, in the state to put a Hillel house right in the middle of campus, literally attached to one of our buildings. Uh, Abby Levine, who I mentioned earlier, helped sponsor the uh, the Hillel House at University at uh, Florida Atlantic University. I think ways the ways in which we've built those kind of relationships uh, in healthcare and education, um, and then I think it's just uh, you know we're very very lucky. We have a group of rabbis and synagogues in our community who spend their time thinking about ways to reach out to the greater community. So. Uh, Rabbi Levin, who you talk about, uh, has built, built re wonderful relationships with the Catholic Church, with African American communities, with um, the Muslim community, and the Interfaith Council. Um, and those kind of rabbis who spend their time thinking, how can we build better relationships with our community? How can we do joint programs with our community? How quickly can we create more Christian Jewish dialogue uh, over a whole host of issues, everything from the way we treat seniors to uh, how we deal with, uh, you know, um, medical care to uh, to just, you know, greater understanding of the Israel issue among the non-Jewish community. I think um, we've had, th those have been great, great ways to build bridges uh, and really make Boca a much more relevant community, whether you're Jewish or not. Is it a relevant community to the young people who grow up in the Jewish community here? We see so many people go off to school and we want them to go to school in different places. That We want them in, their, in the top schools. We want them in the schools of their choice. Do those kids come back? I think we're seeing more and more of them come back. Look, I think there's a group of them that are always going to want to. If you want to be in the financial services industry, you want to spend those two years in New York working on Wall Street for a hedge fund or, you know, uh, if you're a lawyer, you want to work for a Washington law firm because you want that experience. But we're starting to see that indigenous community, that those kids that grew up here, that their parents are engaged in the community. We're seeing them come back here and move back to South Florida and look for jobs. Sometimes they're going to Miami because, they, again, you want that downtown experience or you want a Palm Beach experience. Um, but I do think that we have, a, I think that we're going to be able to compete with those folks more and more to bring them back to our community because of the kind of Jewish community that they grew up in. Because they, if, if what's important to those kids is a Jewish community that nurtures you from cradle to grave, meaning you can put your kid in the Zale preschool on our campus and then send them to Donna Klein K-12 and then get engaged in life or go to B'nai Torah or go to, or go to Bethel preschool or you have that relationship with a rabbi you know, and you're going to meet your beloved and want to come back and raise a family, there's no greater community in the world to do it than in South Palm Beach County. It has everything you want. You know, if you're a sports fan, you got sports and you have culture and you have Jewish life and you have a cultural richness um, in our community of, of, of Judaism, um, literally there's few communities in the country where you have the Reform, the Conservative, and the Orthodox community that play in the same sandbox together every single day with the only, and the only goal being how to make a better Jewish community and a more rich Jewish community. Rich, not wealthy rich, culturally rich Jewish community. I want to ask you about that because sure. Rabbi Levin discussed that with us when he had um, Rabbi Dan Levin from Temple Beth El come in and right. talk about that. And it is remarkable, I think, that there is a different approach to the, um, the interrelationships of the rabbinic council here than you would see you wouldn't necessarily see that in other cities. Do you sure. agree that uh -huh. you're seeing that here? Very much so. So when I took over the, I talked earlier about, um, I don't think South Palm Beach County for many years had a real sense of community. Meaning if, if in Miami, if you're a Reformed Jew living in Kendall and you're an Orthodox Jew living in Aventura, you still feel like you're part of the greater Miami Jewish community. I don't think that South Palm Beach County had that sense of esprit de corps until the last decade. What when changed I took, it? Well, this is not meant as a pat on the back, but five years ago, one of the very first things I did when I took over this community, this community had raised a lot of money but didn't, didn't always behave that nicely, and you had people who had egos, and you had donors, and you had reasons that people wanted to compete, and agencies didn't always get along. And I came in and said, I'm not going to have any of that. We're all going to be growing in the right direction. One of the ways in which I did it is I brought all of the rabbis in the community under my, under my table, not through the Board of Rabbis, which is a great organization. They do wonderful things but sit around our table for the purpose of doing community building and community building only. And so now I've got 
you know, four times a year, I've got all the Orthodox rabbis, all the Reform, all the conservatives sit around my table and talk about all the things that, that, that unite them, not the things that divide them. So when we did a Jewish Unity Day a year ago, I had the senior Chabad rabbi calling the female Reform rabbi, Rabbi Brockman, rabbi from the podium, saying, I want, I want to call upon my friend and partner, Rabbi Brockman, to come up and give the next address. That's not happening in Jewish communities all over America. I mean, there is a wall between the Orthodox community very much and the Reform and Conservative. Sometimes it's because of what happens in Israel, fights over women at the wall. And, and in the 1980s, we used to argue with the Israelis. There was a whole movie about who is a Jew, you know, depending on whether, whether you were born Orthodox or whether you were converted by an Orthodox rabbi. Those issues that are out there that divide us, we don't allow to get into the day-to-day -day conversation. Instead, we find ways to bring Jewish education to the forefront, Jewish camping to the forefront, um, celebrating Israel's achievements together. And so today, one of the ways that we've been able to do this is create this outreach by the rabbis um, who take seriously the notion of their role um, as community unifiers in addition to their role as spiritual leaders. Uh, so Josh Brody, who's uh, an Orthodox rabbi that works for Federation, is our director of community engagement, is going with Rabbi Dan Levin this summer to go study at the Hartman Institute together. Um, those are the kind of programs that we're funding and we're able to um, bring to life this kind of rich, culturally rich Jewish community. You're gonna why have is that important? Because, uh, because, there's, uh, because uh, we can be our own worst enemy sometimes uh, in the Jewish community, meaning um, uh, those people who are, are quickest to criticize sometimes can come from our own community. Uh, and uh, so we want to eliminate those things that, we can, that, that divide a Jewish community. Some things you can't get over. Um, there are people who believe in Orthodox education, they'll go to the Orthodox case schools. But if you look at us, in our community, we've got Orthodox and secular pluralistic community day schools. So if you're a Reformed Jew, you have a choice of a whole things. If you're an Orthodox Jew, you have a choice of many different schools. You have, you have a choice of synagogues. Um, that becomes important uh, because we can, w w in a moment of crisis, um, when there's a war in Israel in like the summer of 14, the entire Jewish community came together and at Boca Raton Synagogue, the Orthodox Synagogue, you had Rabbi Brockman speaking from the Bema at an Orthodox Synagogue. Um, so when there's, when there's a crisis, when there's um, things to celebrate as a community, meaning next year we're going to celebrate Israel's 70th, the entire community is going to come together for an Israel fest. Uh, as we have in the last uh, few years, both in 15 and then in 13. How, how difficult an achievement is that, really, when we try to quantify and to qualify how um, large an achievement that is to have that kind of dialogue, to have that kind of cohesiveness within the Jewish community here in Boca Raton? How unusual is that? Well, let me say it this way. Of all the things that I'm the most proud of in my first four and a half years, it's not that we've hit our fundraising goal every year. It's not the peace and harmony of our agencies, those are all good things. Um, it's this piece, the rabbis. It's the rabbis coming together and taking a, their role as community leaders seriously. Uh, and uh, when you have uh, senior rabbis in a community, guys like Dan Levin or David Steinhardt at uh, B'nai Torah, Ephraim Goldberg at Boca Raton Synagogue, who are these wise, who are willing to sit down and put their egos to the side and say, here's what we need to do to make a, uh, a Jewish community that people want to, we want to be the cover of the tourist guide. That's what we want to be. Um, we want to be the reason why a young Jewish family moves to Boca, not Miami, not Hollywood, not Palm Beach, not Atlanta, you know, that they can move to South Palm Beach County, they can find um, uh, a reasonably priced home, and they can find a Jewish community that's open and caring and nurturing uh, and that wants to them to be part of it. Uh, and the good news about this community, it is like that. Because, you know, a lot of times you have a Jewish community, especially the small southern communities like Atlanta and Houston, which are great communities, um, but they're clicky because those people have lived there. You know, the Jewish community in Atlanta has been there for 150 years. Um, you know, there were merchants who came in the first wave of immigration, and that's the way it is in Savannah, and that's the way it is in Memphis. Um, Miami's seven years old, but the same kind of thing. People settled in South Florida. Boca's different. You know, everybody comes from somewhere else. So uh, that's good news, is that you can move to this community and very quickly get engaged in the community, both as a kindergarten mom or as uh, a retiree in Polo who says, oh, you know what, I want to get involved in that Hadassah chapter. I want to involve the Federation. You call somebody and say, you're involved in the Federation? Yeah, we're always looking for someone new. It's an easy place to get engaged in um, uh, where you don't have some of the social constraints otherwise because everybody's in the same boat or most people are in the same boat. And then the indigenous community that's grown up here that are doing their business, they all know each other. Their kids all went to high school together. Their kids went to day school together. And now their kids are graduating. We have a whole group of friends that are, you know, of, of our donor and leadership.
that kids are graduating this week from Pinecrest and St. Andrews and those communities. Um, and they're heavily involved and, uh, and they make Jewish life here very rich. But part of it, there, a lot of the credit I does go to this notion of the rabbis. And I, as of all the things that I'm the proudest of, it's the thing that I, uh, I think has worked the best. And, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't brain surgery. Um, APAC had done a really nice job of reaching out to rabbis 10 years ago and begun a whole rabbinical division. And so I simply just kind of copied the way in which we approached them and say, you know, you guys are going to disagree on all kinds of things. I don't care what you disagree about, but come to my building and talk about the ways in which you can help us build a community campaign. The other change that's gone on in the last five years since I got there, and this is only relevant to me at this moment in time, if we're talking about this as a snapshot in history, uh, our federation uh, up until five years ago uh, funded seven organizations. Um, and, and once I got here and we, we reshaped the way in which we do our beneficiary and we're now um, supporting 55 agencies in the community, including all the synagogues, through micro grants and innovation grants. Uh, and so today, our ability to stretch the Federation dollar is longer and wider than it's ever been. Um, that helps. Mm -hmm. That helps because we can, when you can say to, um, uh, you know, uh, people at FAU or people at Boca Regional Hospital where we're involved, uh, you know, that we're stretching our dollars, it's been, it's been pretty tremendous. Mr. Levin, one last question for you. What do you see as the greatest challenge for Boca Raton's Jewish community as we go forward? I think there are two, there are two pieces. One is continued senior services. Um, we have tens of thousands of, you know, we think about South Palm Beach County as a wealthy Jewish community with snowbirds moving in who have real money, philanthropists. Uh, and yet, in places like Century Village and Kings Point, you've got tens of thousands of seniors who probably live at or under the poverty line. Uh, and depend on Jewish Family Services and JCCs and Federation for Federation Transport Systems to run bus trips. Um, staying on top of that, I think that when you look at the political environment we're in, where um, more and more senior care are going to be strict, you know, stricken from the budget on the federal basis, could put more and more pressure on state and local municipalities and NGOs. I put us in the category of it. If we were talking about overseas, non-governmental yeah. organizations, um, filling that goal and creating a larger safety net. Um, one of the reasons that we just created and built on our campus the Sinai Residence Project, which is a continuing care retirement community, that those seniors who can afford um, uh, to go through the cycle of independent living, assisted, skilled, and ultimately memory care, can live with dignity and security on a Jewish campus and might live in luxury because they want to live in the same way they did in their gated communities or on the beach. And it's also why we have HUD housing for indigent seniors on our campus, to make sure that there's some place for Jews and non-Jews indigent seniors to go. So I think one thing is the senior care, and we have to continue to make sure we're already a premier player in senior services, I think, one of the best Jewish communities in the country. And I'm very proud of the work that the agencies do here in our community. The second piece is special needs, which I also think we're a, a relatively progressive special needs community because of the work of, especially of uh, two JARC. of our agencies, uh, JARC, the Jewish Association of Residential Care, uh, and the JCC, which I think is doing wonderful work mm -hmm. uh, with its special needs, the Schwedelson Special Needs Program. But I think we have gaps. I think we have gaps in coverage. And I think that we are, we've now, our governance at Federation has made a, a decision and we're about a year into a um, dr really hard drill down with a task force um, to be a cradle to grave special needs community. That, you know, a young family that moves here with a, a severely uh, disabled, developmentally disabled child um, literally knows that between zero and five, five and 11, 11 and 18 and 18 on, there's a place for them to go. There's a blueprint to live that, that person to live that life uh, in, both in, uh, in an inclusionary way when possible um, and to, uh, but, and when not possible, uh, that there's an answer outside of the state and institutionalized. Uh, there's activities, there's vocational training, uh, there's a way to give uh, these folks um, uh, and their families a better life than they could get uh, otherwise. And we aspire to be that kind of community. Uh, and so we think over the next several years as our revenue from Sinai um, continues to grow and comes into the community, that will be able to expand greatly both our offerings, both in special needs and in, in senior services long term. Wonderful. Thank you so very much, Matt Levin, for joining us from Federation and uh, telling us about your stories of Boca Raton. Thank you. My pleasure.